1942, he stepped forth like some warrior of old to lead and inspire vast forces of men. At a pace never equaled, his third army swept across the continent of Europe. No American leader was more colorful and more successful. General George S. Patton, Jr., dedicated to glory and the victory that was won. The name, the symbol, the victories, our history. It's not easy to believe that George S. Patton, Jr. was once just Georgie. From his earliest years, this lad believed he was going to be General George S. Patton, Jr. His imagination was stirred by stories of great heroes of the past, told by his father. His military career began at VMI. At West Point, he proved himself a model cadet, although, like Washington and Napoleon, he could not spell. Rarely from this time on would Georgie flash this attractive smile. It just didn't go with his very serious ideas of soldiering. He established the first football team for soldiers to keep them from wasting their off hours in drinking and gambling. World War I, convinced that this ponderous vehicle would someday come into its own, he studied it, rode into battle on it, became a hero alongside it. Our first tank commander, he would always be linked with the weapon that symbolized his driving, overwhelming personality. After the war, the tank school at Fort Meade. Two officers here shared a deep military interest, Ike Eisenhower and Georgie. The fierce expression, his get-up at masquerades, reflected some deep instinct to play the role of warrior or fighter. His wife joined in, sensing that even in fun, these roles suited her soldier husband. The time came as it had before when the clothing of battle was to be worn by millions of Americans. November 1942, in command of American forces for the invasion of North Africa, Lieutenant General George S. Patton, Jr. Outstanding features of a brief campaign was Patton's bold leadership and later the favorable impression he created on French and Arabs alike. Long range plans could now be discussed. Plans which would cast America's toughest general in a leading role. Meanwhile, a battle was raging to the east in Tunisia. to a pitch of fighting spirit entered the fray. Allied leaders such as General Alexander sensed Patton's remarkable military gifts, his judgment, his sure instinct for what the enemy would do. Patton set a tank trap for Rommel. Rommel marched right into it. His 10th Panzer Division lost half its 60 tanks, retired, and never attempted a counterattack.
His reputation grew. He looked forward eagerly to his next campaign. He'd been selected to command a new army, the 7th, slated for the conquest of Sicily. from Patton to his men. Remember that we as attackers have the initiative. We must retain this tremendous advantage by always attacking, rapidly, ruthlessly, viciously, without rest. Keep punching. God is with us. We shall win. Attack, attack, and when in doubt, attack again. Patton's major principle for fighting battles or a war. His chief mission, he believed, was to arouse the morale of his men. He urged them on, certain that speed and boldness could shorten the war. Like Monty, he believed in showmanship. But he was aware that if the act could not be carried off in fine style, the men would see through it. Both leaders used every means to inspire the troops of their vast command. Sicily proved to be a model campaign. Sound tactics and a fighting spirit won the island in 38 days. The Supreme Allied Commander paid a visit. Passionately involved in the work at hand, Patton had acquired a reputation for being tempestuous, sometimes rash. There was a question as to his role in the invasion of Fortress Europe. Then, his whereabouts carefully concealed from the German High Command, he appeared in Great Britain. New troops heard him in an introductory speech and called him Old Blood and Guts. The old timers referred to him as the old man who knew more about fighting than any man alive. He called a spade a spade. He told them to get mad and stay mad. They listened. On D-Day, behind Bradley's first army, another army assembled, Patton's third. With plenty of armor, this outfit was like its commander. Fast, hard-hitting, spirited, spectacular. Cherbourg Peninsula began a rolling advance, an all-out smashing attack, the patent version of a German blitzkrieg. The 
old man had said, the harder we push, the more Nazis we'll kill. And the more Nazis we kill, the fewer of our men will be killed. Pushing means fewer casualties. The third took the old man at his word and found he was right. St. Malo, the beginning of a long list of towns, occupied by Germans one day, liberated the next. At the head of a vast crusading army, a man fulfilling a destiny he had dreamed of since early youth. The attacks now were in all directions at once, toward the south and north and east toward Germany. advanced like a tidal wave. And the enemy's response was fear. He told his men, in the last two weeks, the third has advanced farther and faster than any other army in history. My intention is to move farther and faster still. Outrunning its maps, the third army crossed the Seine. In his words, he was touring France with an army. He was everywhere at once, covering the great distances within his command. His use of light aircraft exemplified his eagerness to adopt any new means of increasing efficiency. Throughout, the 19th Tactical Air Command of the 8th Army Air Force gave incredibly close support. The astounding advances went on and on. Patton saw nothing in the way. He was ready to push on into the heart of Germany. Struggling to keep up with his fast-moving front was a miraculous supply effort known as the Red Ball Express. But now Patton's supply lines were strained to the utmost. Winter was approaching. Other Allied armies were feeling the pinch. The third was ordered to hold up, to take the defensive. Nothing but defeat itself could have made the general more depressed. This was a difficult time for an army built to roll. Tension for Patton was finally eased. He was assured by his old friend that the third would eventually receive adequate supplies to resume what they had begun. Patton urged his leaders to keep high the morale created during the offensive. He himself delivered the pep talks for which he was famous, giving credit, instilling pride, urging men to even greater deeds. Then, the green light. In 400 years, this fortress city had withstood every assault.
Metz was no cheap victory. But the fall of this highly regarded fortification bore out Patton's belief that no defense position had ever been successfully defended. With General Walker at the front, new plans now. A great drive toward the highly reputed Siegfried line. But an instinct for what the enemy will do had alerted him to a new danger. Field Marshal von Rundstedt struck with 20 divisions on a 40-mile front. The Battle of the Bulge. Patton was asked to speed what help he could. Could it be in three days, Ike asked? Patton's armored troops would make it in two, dashing 100 miles over icy roads to Bastogne. Part of a major attack, Patton's concentrated armored power. Terrible weather prevented a much needed air attack. A religious man, Patton frequently prayed. This time, a prayer went out on thousands of printed cards for all his men to join him. Almighty and merciful Father, grant us fair weather for battle. on the defensive. In Patton's book, they were destined to fail. The third broke the back of the German offensive and began preparations for their own. Always the old man pushed them harder than anyone had pushed them before. Always the results were more than they might have expected. For a commander who was so obviously a winner, they would do the impossible. Patton believed in decorations, in recognizing and exalting the heroic qualities of his men. And they sensed his sincerity when he used words like duty, patriotism, and loyalty. To him, these words had real meaning. The Siegfried Line. In Patton's words, this monument to the stupidity of men cracked easily. Famous third was now on the loose again, on a spring rampage that would bring the war to a close before summer. Again, Patton's army was going beyond expectations. The enemy believed Patton would pause at the Rhine. He went right across. Now along a wide front, his divisions fought toward the final goal.
Always he took time out to give credit where it really belonged, to the men, to Private Harold A. Garman, the Medal of Honor. Exalting sacrifice, Patton never dwelt long on the horrors of war. But as his third army overran concentration camps in Germany, he saw horror of a new kind. piled up as the third turned southwest to link up with Soviet forces in the Danube Valley. It was over. For a moment, Patton relaxed his carefully maintained role of colorful leader to be himself. On his return, Americans showed their gratitude. In General Pershing's words, it didn't hurt America to have a general so bold that he was dangerous. Los Angeles went all out in its reception. With him was General Doolittle, whose Eighth Air Force in Europe did so much to assure final victory. Although no unit, no individual won the war, we're fortunate in having one here tonight with us who had a large part in winning the war. I'm pleased and proud to have been privileged to fight by the side of General George Patton. Your Honor, the Mayor, General Doolittle, soldiers, ladies and gentlemen, coming over here, there was a very great lesson. The first four hours, we passed over a destroyed land, utterly destroyed. You who have not seen it do not know what hell looks like from the top. That's what Germany looks like. That's what Austria looks like. That's what any place that the 8th Air Force and the 3rd Army worked on looks like. You must remember this, that from Brest to various towns in southern Germany and Austria, whose names I can't pronounce, but who, whose places I have removed, Trail of the 3rd Army and the 19th Tactical Air Command and the 8th Air Force is marked by more than 40,000 white crosses, 40,000 dead Americans. Few realized how deeply he felt about his men. Germany, with no more battles to win, Patton watched Americans compete on the playing field. Again, he saw the fighting spirit, the will to win, a quality he loved and admired, and which epitomized himself. Struggle was the test of a man. War, the supreme struggle, provided the highest test. He had expected his own death to be spectacular. In this one prediction, he was more mistaken than in the planning of any battle.
He died of injuries received in an automobile accident four months after the end of the war. place of burial among the men of the Third Army who had fallen in the Battle of the Bulge. His personality lives on in his statue at West Point. He lived for action and glory and reached the heights in serving his country. <laughs>